we're going to put up a, a graphic on the screen for you because I think it's worth taking a helicopter view of where uh, Irish rugby is uh, for the, the women and professionalism. So uh, you would have seen to great fanfare last November, the big announcement, there are 29 contracts and suddenly all is well in the women's game. It's actually a more complicated picture than that. So we've, we've tried to divide up the, the 23 players into uh, three different columns. So you'll see on the left, those players on the left are on full-time contracts. They're based in Dublin at the High Performance Unit. They're training away together every day. And then the middle column, we have a whole host of players, including you know the likes of Sam Monaghan, who's one of Ireland's best players last year, and the captain, who you just heard from, Nicola Friday. They're playing for Premiership clubs over in the UK. And then the third column, we have players who are still based in Ireland. They have decided for various reasons not to take contracts. And so they're training when they can, but certainly they're not up in the high performance unit on a regular basis. So that is the more complicated picture of professionalism in the Irish game at the moment, Fiona. Uh, it's not ideal. Uh, like for instance, you'd have a lot of the Scottish and Welsh players all playing in the UK. They'd all be in that middle column there. Mm. Where do we want the majority of our Irish players? Like, is there an argument they're all better off playing for clubs in the Premiership? Do we all want them just training amongst themselves but not playing games in the high performance unit? Where are we trying to get to here? <laughs> I think everyone involved in Rugby Joe has um, an opinion on this. Um, as a coach uh, in the AIL level, I suppose, and looking at what's going on now and looking at the difference between, we saw Wales really hit at home for me last weekend when I saw how physically dominant they are, how they went about their business. I know they're playing in the Premiership week in, week out. So I think we just need, and, and the RFU need to focus on having competitive games, competitive games all year round for these players, be it if it's in England, it's in England, but we have to get to the situation of maybe extending the interpros, maybe having more games at that level, if that's the higher level now. As I said, people have arguments, I love the club game, but we've they've got to invest in the club game if that's the way it's going to go because let's we, we've played, we're, we've all been involved in that and it's probably outside the top four at the minute, there isn't very many competitive games. So these girls are thinking, oh, I've had a physical game there and when they go into international rugby and we saw how shell-shocked they were last week. Yes. That's when it hits home. Because even people have made the point, Linda Jugang, you know, I, I don't know who she's scrummaging against up in the high-performance unit because there's no one else there to scrummage against. I mean, you'd almost say you might be better off over in the UK as well, but I, I'm not sure how you see it, Sonny. Yeah, um, and the Celtic Cup League, that was a pilot as well from a mm. competition perspective. The windows are set, like at the global window, you know, September, October sort of time. Um, our regional comp, which is exactly the Six Nations, and then you've got windows to set your domestic comps in between. Mm. So I personally think just make the decision in terms of what the pinnacle domestic comp is. Have it yes. before the window of your global comp and work it through window before the regional comp. The question around the premiership, 100%, and I've been involved in an exit of setup. Super high performance, it's unbelievable. Right. Nicola Friday is training, playing the house down. She's probably one of the best locks in the Premiership across all of the teams, and the world's best players are going over there. It's that balance of players having the opportunity to be exposed by that, and also having the opportunity to have quality coaching and support resource around them here in the country so you can balance making sure that pathways are here, mm. young girls can see it, and they can have the opportunity. But it's a tricky situation, but the key thing is to make a decision on your pinnacle yeah. domestic competition. I do think, though, that if, if you do ask the players to come back and base in Dublin and focus full-time and leave the Prem and play up in Dublin, you're going to strengthen the Dublin clubs, which are already, if you look at the top four, mm -hmm. um, there's three of those four teams up there in the top four. So you're, you're almost making the AIL, you're, you're making that division wider between the top four and the bottom four by strengthening Dublin, because you have to be based in Dublin to be in that high-performance setup. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. It's it's do they do they ask players to play with certain clubs if it's they're investing in the club game? Do they say okay, let's send her down to Cork, let's go up to to Ulster there to play because you have to like if you're living in Dublin and training in Dublin, you're not going to travel down to Cork yeah. to train during the week. So it's about finding, as Sena said, that pathway and sticking with it and investing in it. Okay. If, you, if you look at the twenty three, Nicole Cronin, I think is the only person not on the 23 living outside of Dublin. Right. The rest, even though they have Munster on their back, and right. they're still living in Dublin. Well, we're not going to solve it right now, but it's, <laughs> it's good to keep people at home just to, the sense that it is tricky in reality. 